the three mind poisons and the good monk with a bad habit. That's the title of this podcast, which just came from a conversation I was, or a declaration, a Dhamma declaration I was giving in the kitchen with my wife and then uh, I decided to record it because actually uh, most of my recordings come from when I only have one person to talk to around me and it's maybe not their favourite subject and I need to get it out so this one was inspiring and I'd like to share it with you all so the three mind poisons lope crot long in Thai or lopa uh, kota and uh, Moka, Lopa, Dosa and Moka in Sanskrit, which means greed, anger and ignorance or greed, um, anger, I, I like to explain that slightly differently and ignorance, ignorance I would like to look at more as um, falling in fixation. Becoming fixated with things comes from ignorance. And that anger should... I look at anger more as um, attraction and aversion. It's uh, it's an, uh, something to do with attraction and aversion. That um, you might feel angry because you come across something you don't like. Well, I translate you don't like... I don't like into, uh, this is something I want to not have to encounter. Think of the wording. I want to not, I desire to not see this person, my enemy, who I hate. Yeah. Not, I don't want to see this person. That sounds like the opposite of desiring. Sounds like not desiring. Not desiring is Buddhahood. We think we have things that we desire and things we don't desire. Yeah, Things we like and things we hate. But actually what we have is attraction and aversion. Aversion is like repulsion of a magnet and attraction is like attraction of a magnet. So things which attract us and things which we would like to avert avoid aversion avoidance and so both are actually two sides of the same coin talking about anger yeah is that you desire to have or to not have but it's both a desire it's the desire to have and the desire to not have not the desire to have and the lack of desire to have. Yeah. You, when you don't want to see this person, you are desiring a situation where that person is not there. So you're still desiring. Yeah. And that is desire. One of the three mind poisons. Lopa, and that's tosa. Huh? To, uh, grod in Thai. Tosa, tosa in Sanskrit. Anger. It doesn't really mean anger and should not be understood like that. It's two sides of the same coin. Is wanting and not wanting causes anger. So uh, aversion and attraction. I want this and I want to not this. Yeah, is a craving. Coming from craving is the cause of suffering. Anger is fire. Fire is hell. The Buddha. Uh, anger is fire. Fire is hell. And so this mind poison comes from craving. And uh, lopa, lopa, or lop in Thai, lopa in Sanskrit. Um, Greed, Uh, insatiability, desire, craving. And so craving, greed, is craving one and the same 
and boil it all down to craving. Yeah. Not greed for money. Not greed for food. Craving for more. Insatiability. People say that if you're insatiable when you're born again, you'll be a hungry ghost, which means uh, you can find water. If you can find some water when you're so thirsty all the time, you can't even get it down your throat because your throat's too thin for the water to pass through or it burns you like acid or whatever. Uh, insatiable hunger and thirst for things. And that the, the, the third one was moka or moha ignorance which i say is due to ignorance this third mind poison moha moha is um we are all ignorant and unenlightened and we also don't keep our minds focused to keep what is called sati so you are aware of what you are falling into as you think and so as you think your monologue or your dialogue in your head, if you're talking to somebody, it's an imaginary dialogue. If not, it's you're talking to yourself, it's a monologue. So you, have a, you are a listener listening to yourself talking when you're thinking. And uh, long, in Thai, the word Thai, long, means to lose your way. Long tang, get lost in a labyrinth. So moha, mo mo ignorance, is... Uh, the Thai pronunciation of the Pali word, Sanskrit word, but the Thai translation they use is long. Yeah, long means to get lost, to lose one's way. Mm. Or to become lost in something. Long, I could fall in love with somebody. I also long, yeah. Mm. And so the, the Sanskrit word for ignorance and the Thai Pali Sanskrit word for ignorance and its translation as long and my understanding of that, the, the translation to conceptualize it in English is to become fascinated with something. Something attracts your attention. Something attracts your attention that is the ignorance factor. Um, you're from Yorkshire, England. You used to eat fish and chips with mushy peas. Fish and chips with mushy peas. Yeah. And, uh, or you're, you, you, you're from the south of the States and you want to eat hominy grits and ham and eggs. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. You're from Scotland. You want to eat some uh, haggis. I think more English people eat haggis than Scots, actually. A lot of Scots I've met say they don't like haggis. Anyway, that's a digression. And that is long. Uh, losing my way. No concentration. Which is why I'm making this podcast to not forget these thoughts. For myself and for those who it has meaning for. So long was precisely that. What I just did got lost in something. Now, when you get lost in something, you might think about, I would think a lot about my childhood days in Malta and a time of innocence before I saw anything bad in the world and when the skies were blue and the grass was green. And when I think about that, I long, I get moka, I get ignorance because in reminiscing the and don't forget not being enlightened is because the mind is always lost in the past or the future and never in the present moment. So there I am in the past reminiscing about my innocent, happy days as a kid in Malta, on the island of Malta with my boat and my water ski. And yeah, and uh, this then invokes, the thought invokes an emotion because when you think of something, um, how you condition it in your memory with your memory association will cause you to think friend, enemy, good times, bad times. You might feel uh, anger, adrenaline, ready to fight, run, fight or flight, or feel happy and love towards the thing you're seeing approaching because your memory association says, this is my sister or this is my mum or this is my enemy. 
yeah and your body will have serotonin and adrenaline and different things from your brain released after you have thought and conditioned something into your mum or your enemy somebody you love or somebody you hate that will cause emotions to happen such as anger the other mind poison so now we've gone from thinking ignorance thinking about a can of mushy peas on the Thailand supermarket shelf thinking oh I haven't eaten those for 30 years since I was in England I'm lost and I'm getting the desire for mushy peas and it's the last one they say it's just a showpiece and they won't sell it to me and I really want it and he won't sell it to me and so then they get angry and the anger is also chemical from things my brain is associating with memory association and so these three mind poisons roll and roll and roll and here we come to the beginning of what I was saying in the kitchen to my girlfriend about these three mind poisons is that loba, desire, craving, greed uh, and tosa or dosa uh, um, anger or uh, the anger that comes from wanting to have or to not have wanting to or wanting to not wanting not to or wanting to yeah uh, the ang uh, anger is something that comes from that and I would say not only anger actually I would just say emotion I really would say emotion it's such a sadness yeah but they will focus on anger in the Buddhist teachings as the mind poison. I would say it was the reaction of an emotional reaction. Yeah. All emotional reactions, not just anger. But we will focus on the anger to, um, in order to be able to expound the teaching. If not, it would be too complex. But you can apply it to all the other emotions. Or maybe not, you try that out yourself. You investigate yourself. Don't believe me, investigate yourself. Within yourself. And so, anger. Without mokha, ignorance, the falling in love with, the enchantment, the getting um, curiosity towards something. Yeah, the fascination. The interest, something raises your interest, mokha, ignorance, falls into, you lose your stillness and fall into whatever has attracted you. Uh, without the presence of this ignorance, anger or other emotions cannot arise. Uh, the anger cannot arise without ignorance. If there is no ignorance, there is no anger. And uh, loba, greed, craving, also arises through ignorance. And so of the three mind poisons, ignorance is one of the mind poisons, greed, anger and ignorance. Or if you take greed, as I explained, to be craving, to have or not have something, to have to do or not have to do, have to see or not have to see, have to put up with or not have to put up with, have to enjoy or not have to enjoy. Mm. Yeah, and uh, that's greed. Uh, the simplified word is greed and anger as that actually could be any emotion that would arise but anger arises through ignorance and it's the mind poison. But sadness is also a mind poison. So there you go. Uh, it should be expanded upon once you've understood this tr triple principle, hmm? this trilogy. So it's interesting to notice that the first two, if we list them in this order, greed, anger, ignorance, 
that greed cannot occur without ignorance. Anger cannot occur without ignorance. But ignorance does not necessarily have to have um, anger. Yeah. But ignorance will have craving, which is the first one, greed. Because if you are ignorant, you are still craving. If you're looking in the past, remembering, then you're craving a feeling or craving a memory or mm, you're craving hunger, you're craving this and craving that is the ignorance of craving. So these three things, they're very interlinked, but the ignorance and craving are interlinked. Craving is a product of ignorance. And if ignorance is present, craving will be present in one form or another. Craving to have or not have something. Hmm? Craving for the rain to stop even. Whatever. Yeah. But ignorance is always present. And the other two, craving and anger, uh, greed, sorry, greed and anger, mind poisons cannot arise if the ignorance mind poison doesn't doesn't is not present first yeah and so through ignorance greed and anger exists as mind poisons and ignorance is a mind poison the three mind poisons but if we can understand easily that greed is craving and you can understand both sides of the coin that there's no such thing as not craving except Buddhahood. And that what normal humans think of as not craving is just the other side of the coin of craving. That you have the craving to have or not have, to meet or not meet, to have to do or to not have to do. But it's a craving, a craving to not or a craving to. A craving to yes or a craving to no. Yeah, and if you can understand both forms of craving instead of the dualistic, illusory concept of craving and not craving, yeah, because the not craving comes much later with Buddhahood, with awakening. And the three mind poisons we have ignorance, therefore, craving arises and is co present, but ignorance is the cause of the craving. Yeah, the craving is not the cause of the ignorance. Goes in that order. Avicca, the ignorance. Yeah, mokha, ignorance. Avicca is also not knowing. Avicca is the cause of an enlightenment, and the cause of rebirth, and the cause of dependent origination. Is avicca, is not knowing. Yeah, and mokha, they also say ignorance as a mind poison. English translations, lost in translation here, because that's a simple word for mokha. It's actually enchantment getting attracted to it, something raising your attention, and then your mind conditioning it using memory association, and then getting attracted towards it or repulsed by it, yeah? craving to move towards it or away from it. The craving arises. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see that the ignorance has a separate way of linking with the other two mind poisons. And it's also important to understand the first in the list. It's not the first. It's only first because humans listed in the imaginary list as number one. Greed yeah, has two sides to it, having and not having. Yeah, the greed to have or not have, the yes and the no, the greed to yes, the greed to not, and the craving of having and not having. If we understand the first mind poison properly like this, and the second mind poison of anger, that we understand that actually, yes, anger is a mind poison, also arising from the third mind poison of ignorance, but not just anger. All emotions are mind poisons, sadness, all forms of excitement and uh, non-stillness. 
even happy excitement, yeah, but you're overexcited and your heart's beating fast. Actually, you're suffering and you don't realize it. You're just excited on the big wheel as you're scared as it flies around so high in the sky on the big wheel, the London Eye. Woo! You go see a horror movie and get scared to, out of your wits and think you really enjoyed it when actually you suffered like hell through it. That's suffering without being conscious of it. And um, so that was greed, anger and ignorance. And that ignorance uh, causes us to raise things to attract our attention with our senses and that when we think of something we use memory association to remember and associate it with things. The smell of strawberries might remind us of something good or bad depending on our past. On events with strawberries you might be allergic and have gone to hospital because you ate some accidentally once and so if you smell some you feel very bad but another person smells them and thinks mm, wow I remember strawberries and cream as a baby as a, as a child and has a good feeling and so strawberries are not essentially good or bad They're, what they generate in you depends on after you perceive it your mind then names it as a strawberry as soon as it recognizes it through memory association it makes a decision of whether it likes it or not approves or not and feels disgusted or, uh, or delighted. And after that, the brain releases chemicals and the body actually feels unwell or feels uh, orgasmic, yeah? Gets a hit of it, which causes craving as well. Craving to not have to feel disgusted and craving to get another hit of this nostalgic feeling I just got from that old song from the 70s that reminds me from my childhood in Malta. Yeah. And uh, that is being lost in those, that is mocha ignorance, being like a cork in a storm on the ocean, being just passed around from whirlpool to whirlpool of thought. And each thought generates an emotion so uh, being passed from whirlpool to whirlpool of thought, like being a boat without a rudder uh, or a ship without a captain at the wheel, meaning we're not awake through meditation. Yeah, not awake. We are when we're meditating, it's temporary. That's called covering the grass with a plate. The grass goes away. You take the plate off, a few days later the grass comes back again. That's like meditating for an hour. You get very peaceful and you can even see the enlightened thought process begin to happen sometimes if you're lucky. Some of you will. Some of you will know about that in your meditation and start to see the unconditioned uh, in some states and think, wow, this is great, I've seen it now, it's good. And you leave the room, 10 minutes later after your meditation, somebody insults you and you get angry. Because you left the, the, the focus of the meditation when you left the room. You forgot that when you were meditating, the state of awareness you reached that did not allow ignorance to arise, you weren't supposed to leave it in the room after the meditation bell rang that your 45 minutes were over. You suppose, those 45 minutes were to get you into the state so you realize how nice it is to have your mind awake and that after with that, when you walk out the door and go downstairs, go to work, that you should sustain that state of mind throughout the day or try to sustain it as long as you can until somebody asks you a question and you forget to keep focused and you're gone until the next time when you're meditating and you realize that you've been lost in thought since the last time you came to meditate, like a cork in a storm on the ocean, or a boat without a rudder, or a ship without a captain at the steering wheel. And so, understanding the three mind poisons more deeply than these simple greed, anger and ignorance, 
which might cause you to think that only anger can arise from ignorance, but sadness not, and sadness is not a mind poison, and that there are only three mind poisons. It should actually be craving, emotion, and um, the evolutionary programmed by nature tendency to raise our curiosity at our surrounding environment and even our own inner thoughts and memories. Curiosity, yeah. Which is a natural thing for animals to have in evolution and programmed into our bodies by nature. And that the conditioning of our brains through perception causes this ignorance, what the Buddhist calls the ignorance of being lost in thought in the past and the future and in conditioning a cloud of molecules into a table and a chair and even conditioning nothing into a cloud of molecules because it's not even a cloud of molecules but you know actually the whole universe is one big cloud of molecule particles and spaces between is the most simple you can go and uh, the, the tables, chairs, planets, stars, rooms, houses individual items that seem separate from each other are actually just chimeras because they're just more particles with spaces between them in a one big cloud. But we can't see it because it's too small. And so nothing is separate. And we don't see these things not in meditation because of ignorance, greed, anger and ignorance. So greed, craving, anger, emotion, reaction, to a conditioned thought due to a chemical release by the brain after the th conditioned thought happens. Ignorance, a conditioned thought process that arises because something in your senses has rung a bell and attracted your attention. It might be something you hear, a song from the 70s. And it's not a song from the 70s until it enters your eardrum. Your eardrum takes the vibrating molecules of oxygen and hydrogen and decodes it into something that gets put into an, an actual experience which we call sound. And uh, then it actually becomes something which we recognize the pattern of its algorithm and it becomes music. And our memory association, long-term memory, then associates it with an identical pattern in our memory. And no, it's our favorite song from when we were children, when I lived on the island of Malta as a child in the 70s. Yeah? And that all came from just some vibrating molecules passing through the air from a loudspeaker or some band's instruments into my ear, vibrating a drum in my ear, going to my brain, uh, my awareness, my consciousness becoming aware of the, se of the sensory perception of a smell or a sound or a sight. Yeah. And all of a sudden, oh my God, that's Ella Fitzgerald singing the Pepsodent toothpaste advert song. Yeah. So... I'll finish now with the good monk with the bad habit. The good monk with the bad habit is something that if I told you an imaginary, this is imaginary, huh? I'm not talking about a real person. There was once a monk and he was very good. He kept all of the major rules of the Vinaya of the Buddhist canon for monks. He woke up and prayed and meditated every day. He only ate once a day. And he would walk the full arms round every day and perform the prayers in the evening and give a good teaching and never show any desires towards any possessions or take any of the temple's money for himself and just use it for the good of the people and practiced very, very hard and was a very pure monk. But sometimes he would speak in ways knowing that if he spoke in this way, it's more attractive and it would make people have faith 
in his words. And he would get lots of devotees and many followers. And he wants to have many followers. So this monk is suffering greed. Not greed for money. Not greed for fame even. He might not even want to have world fame. Or he might want greed for fame. But in this story, he doesn't. In this story, all he wants is lots of followers. But he's very pure and he practices properly. But he suffers the craving to have lots of students. If it boosts his ego or if it's because he thinks he will get more merit or if he thinks it will help him to get further along the path or whatever. But it is a craving. Craving to have lots of disciples. So this monk, you know, he's good and he keeps all the rules and everything, but, you know, he really, really craves to have lots of disciples. Well, some years ago, I would not have understood it how I do now. And I would have said, well, that's not, I'm not past for me. That's terrible. That's disgusting. I'm not, this monk, I'm don't, not having it. Now I would say, actually, if you look, this monk has succeeded in um, proficiency in, and prowess in the practice of purity and self-renunciation um, in almost everything he has laid his hand to and is a good monk in everything. And he, only a Buddha does not suffer craving or ignorance, or emotions such as sadness, like ang afflictive emotions, dukkha, suffering. Not all emotions, afflictive emotions, hmm? moods, mood, mood, hmm? ambience within. You have an atmosphere outside, and the atmosphere inside is what you call your emotion, your mood. Yeah, there's the vibrations and chemicals within your bloodstream. It's actually physical, it's not just psychological. That's why meditation is hard sometimes if your conditioned mind is causing chemicals that will be stressful to flow through your body. Yeah, such as adrenaline. And you think if you think too much in the wrong way about the wrong things, that things that make you angry or sad, you form a neural network, it becomes a cage, and you lock yourself in a, a cycle of negative thought, which actually gets stronger and stronger, because each time you think it, a spark fires, and another neural network makes like a spider web of within your neurons, in your brain. And so the way to break out of negative thought is to force yourself to list and think positive thoughts to stop the pattern. If not, you just keep locking yourself in an ever tighter web of negative thoughts. So the monk is very well practiced, but he's only failing in one single thing. He is not seeing his own uh, ignorance, mind poison, in the craving of wanting to have lots of students for good or bad reasons, whichever reason, for good reason. He wants it for a good reason, so that more people can understand the Dhamma. But still, he wants lots of disciples, or he wants lots of disciples because he wants to be remembered as a great teacher. And that's all. But the rest, he's absolutely almost impeccable in his practice of everything. Well, you can't pick fault with a monk that has done so well with everything in all his practices and in just one single aspect of his practice he is failing. Well, that's what being a monk is about. It's about per self-perfection and it's a constant progression. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And so when you find an imperfection in a monk like that, you should not really say he is completely unusable. You should say he's a human like me and he's trying his best. He's managed to, can already do better than me up to here. But beyond that point, he's not that strong yet. 
he's still not as good as that monk or he didn't do as well as the Buddha yet. Well, so what? He's not that far along the path. Give him a chance. He needs another 10 years. You watch a monk after one year, 10 year, five year, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Some don't practice and never learn, but watch one who practices and see him. I know well-practiced monks who have been publishing for 20 years now in English. For example, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who I like very much. Dhammatalks.org, D-H-A-M-A-T-A-L-K-S dot O-R-G, Dhammatalks.org, Tanisaro Bhikkhu's teachings. Yeah? And... If you can go back right to the beginning of his recordings and you can actually, apart from them all being great teachings from the beginning, but you can see his own progression of his own practice and how he has slowly become more awakened and more deeper in his own understanding as his teachings have evolved. Yeah. And um, become more impeccable. And then when you get to 20 years later, his teachings now, and listen to one of his first ones, you find something that you found impeccable when you heard it, but you say, okay, he made a small inaccuracy here, or a small, he's still talking about himself in that period. Now he never mentions himself. A lot of monks teach saying, when I was in the jungle, I did this and I achieved that and I saw that. So it's possible, you know, all you have to do is this. Actually, a good teacher should never talk about themselves. So anyway, uh, the good monk with the bad habit. Uh, a very good monk might have a bad habit. And so that doesn't mean he's not close to Buddhahood or worthy of reverence. It just means you're noticing one of his very few remaining uh, human traits before he becomes enlightened, or she, if it's a bhikkhuni, yeah? But uh, because of one flaw, one single flaw, in what is otherwise a relatively impeccable practice, should not be judged should just be seen as this guy only has this hurdle left to get over and he will be there. But is it good to have that craving for fame or lots of disciples? And it is good to understand that craving itself doesn't have to be for money. Greed, the mind poison of greed, one should understand the word greed as craving and that craving can be for anything. And anger, one should understand that anger means emotion and reaction to conditioned thoughts and memory association. And that it's physical, not just psychological, it's not just angry thought. It's your body with chemicals in it because your brain has recognized an enemy or something it does not want that it wants to not, that it craves to not have to go through. Hmm. And to see the three men, mind poisons in their true essence like this, yeah, that uh, craving has two sides of the coin of wanting to and wanting to not to, and wanting to have and wanting to not have, not wanting to have and not wanting to have. We don't have not wanting. We have wanting to have and wanting to not have, but it's both wanting, craving. Yeah. Unless you're a Buddha, because craving has stopped along with everything else. But to stop craving, craving comes from what? Craving comes from ignorance, the third mind poison. And so if you want to destroy craving, and if you want to destroy dependent origination, which I will explain many times on other days, the 12 uh, links, official links of the chain of dependent origination, which is actually infinite, its cause is also the same thing, ignorance, avicca, 
is the cause of dependent origination, ignorance, not not, not knowing, and uh, moka in the three mind poisons, also translated as ignorance, but actually means uh, getting lost in things that grab your attention and you like or dislike and getting fascinated with them, um, fixations on things. And to understand how these three, three things in their essence, not as greed, anger and ignorance, but as not knowing, loss of control of the mind, being in the present moment, letting it wander, which then uh, a mental conditioning of the things we perceive. That's cause of what makes us ignorant to perceive and condition things for what they are not and make them into what we think they are or what we, our opinion of them is. And um, to understand the three mind poisons a bit more deeply, hopefully from this talk and to understand that one should not, especially when you haven't perfected yourself anyway, should not um, look at one imperfection of a monk that is otherwise a well-practiced monk. Uh, focus on his achievements, not his failures. And at best, don't focus on anything except your own failures and your own achievements, because watching other people isn't going to get you anywhere except for watching the well-achieved, the well-practiced and taking note of what is well-practiced and letting that inspire you to become your own um, well-practiced form of living. And um, don't forget, we are all trying to be good monks, good people, but we have bad habits. And so don't take it out on the good monk with the bad habit. And I hope you know greed, uh, sorry, greed, anger and ignorance a bit better. And I hope perhaps you have a broader vision of a good monk with a bad habit. That's uh, John Spencer for the Buddha Magic Project once more and for the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha and the sake of all beings everywhere. Signing off.